that is not success. That is a pile of money. A pile of money is not success. A pile of money is just a bunch of pieces of paper. That is not success. A big number on a screen is also not success. You might be able to do something cool with some of this money, but what are you willing to do to get that money? And how much of your life is gonna go away to get it? Tonight, we have a very special guest. His name is Mitch Altman. He has been around since the beginning of the digital revolution. He's a hacker and an inventor, known for inventing TV Be Gone, a keychain that turns off TVs in public spaces. He founded the hackerspace Noise Bridge in San Francisco and did pioneering work in virtual reality. Tonight, we will have a keynote by uh, Mitch Altman uh, that goes around the question, can we design tech that serves humanity. And after the keynote, we will have a discussion with tech journalist Gerard Janssen and co-founder of the Dutch Institute for Vulnerability Disclosure and a hacker also, Astrid Oosenbrug. Um, in this conversation, we will dive a bit into uh, Mitch's uh, presentation and try to uncover how the hacker's perspective can change the world for better. Uh, can I have a very warm welcome for Mitch Altman? I'll give a, just a little bit of background about me that is relevant for the talk I want to give. I did, um, with a, a few other people, develop virtual reality uh, back in 1980s. And click, I started my own company in Silly Valley, Silicon Valley, whatever, uh, in the 90s. And uh, it was a storage controller card that could take small hard drives and make them look like wowie zowie, lots of storage. And um, I'm mostly famous, as uh, Yella said, for TV Be Gone, which is, of course, uh, a remote control that turns televisions off in public places, which is even um, more important today in the days to follow with some kind of sports thing going on. I'm not sure. Um, it, it, if you search for it today, there's several articles online, so people still talk about this on mainstream media. Um, I did start Hackerspace in San Francisco called Noisebridge, one of the first ones in the U.S. It turned into an example that many hackerspaces around the world have followed, and I've been going around the world to many hackerspaces and helping them get started and helping them with problems, learning from them and sharing them with other hackerspaces and helping all this get going. Each hackerspace is unique, and they all help each other, and these are amazing communities, and this is part of my talk today as well. So, humans, we've been around on this planet for a while, and through time, We've really made a mess of things. Really bad, horrible mess of things. Climate change is kind of pressing on us right now. You probably all noticed. There's some diseases going around. Maybe it's related to the climate change. Uh, we have all sorts of pollution. We have uh, some weird economic uh, incentive structure that means that a whole bunch of People have nothing, while a teeny, teeny, teeny percentage of people have almost the entire wealth. And that leads to some pretty unstable social situations. We also have technology that's getting more and more powerful and very inexpensive, and it's taking the place of people's jobs. And that's probably a good thing, because people shouldn't be doing those jobs. But unfortunately, if they don't have jobs, they don't have enough money to pay for food and shelter. And if people don't have that, then that leads to some pretty nasty social unrest. And when we have nuclear threat and these wars going on around us, this isn't a good situation that we find ourselves in now. So what to do in the case of this? Well. People here are probably all pretty good with technology, but technology is not the answer. Technology is really powerful, and we can do lots of cool things with it, but when we create technology, we put it out into the world, we have no control over what it is actually used for. It's very powerful, and it will be used for all sorts of things we didn't even think of, but the cultural context that we release all of our creative output into determines what it will be used for. And let me give you some examples. 
This is a really wonderful piece of technology. It can be used for all sorts of things, like you can take a hammer and bop people over the head with them and kill them. But in the cultural context and within which it was released, what it's best suited for is banging nails into wood. And so that's what it's used for primarily. These are the effects of the cultural context that we're surrounded by. When we put something into it, whatever we create, it will be used for what it's best suited for within that context. And we don't have any control over that. And here's some more examples. I've worked for lots and lots of small companies with their electronics projects, and these are just very few of them. My absolute first job was making games as a game developer on uh, Apple II computers. And I made this really cool game. You can go around and you can blow up asteroids and stuff. And, uh, and, and these people with lots of money from the military came and they went to my bosses and they said, hey, that's a nice game you got there. How about if you just do some little customization for it and then we can use it for a killer helicopter simulator? And my bosses said, cool, we'll take the money, that'd be great. And I wasn't so happy with that because that's not why I do what I do. I don't do what I do to kill and destroy and to spy. So I ended up quitting that job. Two years later, I'm working at this company that does interactive museum exhibits. It was actually really cool. You can push buttons and there are these screens with lots of colors and things and you learn a lot. And we had a lot of really good museum exhibits. Uh, but back then, this is you know, 1980, there were no graphics cards back then. So I had to make a graphics generator. And with the help of other people, we made this really cool graphics generator with lots of colors and all this stuff that's probably not as good as a $30 card now. But back then, it was super spiffy. And these people with lots of money from the military came and talked to the bosses. And they say, <laughs> nice graphics generator you got there. How about if we buy those and market weapons systems to Congress? And um, they said, sure, we'll take the money. And then I quit that job. A few years later, I'm at the place where we created virtual reality, and this is a company where none of us would sell to the military. That was very explicit. We did not sell to the military. But we did sell a system that took me three months of my life to put together with the help of a team of people underneath me. We sold it to the University of Central Florida, which of course, like all universities in the US, are funded by the military, and they gave it to the military, and they used it for a World War III training simulator. And I helped. And you can imagine, if you know anything about me by now, that I wasn't too keen on virtual reality after that, and I quit that job. Years later, I start my own company, which makes storage systems, really inexpensive cards, and you can have massive storage for really cheap. And uh, like all Silly Valley companies, uh, it, that's funded by VCs, venture capitalists, also known as vulture capitalists, the scum of the earth. They take over the company like they always do that. And then they make stupid decisions, and they hired a salesperson specifically to sell our stuff to the Secret Service of the United States of America so they could store all of our private information. That's been going on for a while. This isn't new stuff. Snowden came around a lot later, as you'll remember. So uh, TV Be Gone, I quit all this stuff. And in 2004, I made TV Be Gone, which again turns off televisions in public places. And as it turns out, there's no military application for turning TVs off. <laughs> <laughs> so why does this happen? It's not that you know, there were military people following me around to see what cool things I might invent and put out into the world. This is the cultural context. This is true for everybody. The cultural context is really strong, and it does determine what you put out into the world will be used for. We can't necessarily predict it, but this is what happens, especially when, in the country that I no longer live in, the military is over six times bigger than the rest of the world's military combined. It's the single biggest aspect of the economy. And so they have a lot of money to be going around looking at technology to see what it can be used for, for destruction and killing and spying. It's a very powerful context. And what we put out there, people will be looking for how to use it for that. 
So what to do? Well, let's look back on the beginning of humanity for a clue. We survive not because we're big and huge and strong like these things, but because we came together in community to support each other to survive in a sometimes hostile environment. And it worked. We evolved being able to have community to support each other and survive. And even though we don't need a community just to merely survive anymore in our modern world, we still have this deep inner need for community. We still need community in order to feel part of something bigger than ourselves, in order to feel like we're part of something, that life, is, like life matters. We need community to solve our problems individually and collectively, big and small. I found community really for the first time in my life for real many years ago at my first hacker conferences. These conferences are not like your average professional conference. They're full of people just enthusiastically showing off their projects and they're teaching and learning and sharing from one another. We're hanging out with each other, having all these amazing conversations. Unlike society at large, unfortunately not, not like society at large, people spend a lot of time doing stuff they really love doing. And it's, so it's a really high environment. And I love these ones. And here's just one in uh, uh, Brazil from several years ago. Um, this creates a positive uh, cultural context. And so within that context, people release their creative output into it, and some good comes from it more than just releasing it into the cultural context at large. But there still is the cultural context at large to contend with. Hacking is a big part of what I want to get across and probably all of you have a definition for what hacking means. For me, hacking is seeing the world as full of resources, because the world is full of resources of all sorts. Some put there intentionally, other stuff, just, it's just there. Everything's a resource, and we can use those resources any way we want. We can use them to improve our projects of all sorts, and we can see what works and what doesn't work, and then share that with others, and that is what hacking is all about. And most importantly, we do that because it's incredibly enjoyable. It feels great. Hacking is more than just making a thing. Hacking is a mindset, a way of being, a way of living. We can do that, of course, by ourselves, but we can do that even better, sharing our resources in community. And of course, what can be hacked? Well, people think of electronics and computers, but also art and science. You need a hacking mindset to do these things well. Uh, ourselves, we're lifelong living projects that can constantly be improved. Our communities, the planet, the planet sorely needs improvement. And if we don't do it, who will? Everything can and should be hacked. Hacker spaces are a great place where, places where all this goes on. And they're fantastic communities. They're physical places with supportive community that encourages everyone, no matter who, to explore and then do things that are meaningful and wonderful for them, each individually. All sorts of things happen as a result of that. And here's just a few examples. There's just so much that goes on, and you can see people engaged in whatever they're doing, whether it's bio or food or whatever. People are teaching and learning and sharing in community, supported in doing that. And many of you here are involved with it, so you know what I'm talking about, but it gives everyone a sense of accomplishment and a sense of confidence that moves forward with you the rest of your life. It's also fantastic educational environments, unlike schools, unfortunately. But um, th for those reasons and many more, there's now thousands of them in the world, each unique, many of them all helping other ones. And these are fantastic communities for people to experience this and to learn and grow and to start solving some of the problems facing us. It's not easy and it takes time and I don't know if we have the time, but at least this is a beginning of that process. So let's share 
our skills, our resources, our experiences. Let's explore, and we can do this so much better in community than on our own. Find cool things to do. Maybe we can start solving our problems together, big and small, personal and societal. But before I go, I want to ask you one more question, because this is a really important question, because it determines so much. What is success? It's important to think about this because it provides so much motivation and if the motivation is going in the wrong direction, it's good to be aware of. I think we all have to determine the answer to this question for ourselves. Is that success? No, <laughs> that is not success. That is a pile of money. A pile of money is not success. A pile of money is just a bunch of pieces of paper. That is not success. A big number on a screen is also not success. You might be able to do something cool with some of this money, but what are you willing to do to get that money? And how much of your life is gonna go away to get it? That's not success. Success is something very different. For me, this is what it is, and I've already said it. If I'm doing something that I super enjoy and find meaningful, and in doing that, I get enough of what I need to keep doing that, that's success for me. I get enough of what I need to live a life I really love living. And what more do I need? The future is up to us. Because if we wait for our leaders to do any of this, we're going to be dead. <laughs> but while we're alive, we can do all sorts of things to create opportunities for ourselves, for the people around us, and hopefully eventually for everyone. That's the goal. Community and more positive context so that what we do and put out into the world has some possibility, hopefully, for more good than harm. And that's my vision. So again, here's my contact info. I would like to invite the other two guests as well. Astrid Osenbrug, co-founder of DIVD, uh, the chair of uh, queer organization COC, and the former politician for the Labour Party of the Netherlands. Please have a seat and warm applause for Astrid. <laughs> and uh, the last guest is Gerard Janssen, tech journalist for uh, the folks can't write, and he wrote a book, uh, Hackers, uh, uh, on the hackers community. Uh, warm well, welcome for Gerard Janssen. <laughs> well, Mitch, thank you uh, a lot for your presentation, and um, Astrid and Gerard for being here. In your presentation was, can tech serve humanity? Uh, how would that look like? Uh, what is what is human-centered tech to to? Well, how, how can we envision that? <clears throat> I wish I had an answer for that. <laughs> um, we haven't seen it yet, really. We've seen a lot of tech have aspects of um, human-centered good. The internet started off with a lot of people being very idealistic, and um, many of us in the early days used it in idealistic ways to try to you know, help ourselves for learning and help others by teaching and also by organizing through the internet. But now we see the internet is way worse than any spy uh, setup ever. Um, so even though internet can still be used for all the things that I said the early internet was about, it's got a dark side now. And organized crime, which is not separable, especially in the US, from government, um, is making really good use of the other aspects of the internet. So everything has pluses and minuses. It's just how do we create something that has more good than harm? And that's what I don't have an answer for, but I think if we're going to find out, it's got to be through people having opportunities in community. And like I, I mentioned, it's a slow process. First, people have to just be amazed and, uh, and try things and just making blinky lights is great, but that's not gonna solve any of our bigger problems. Um, that can come later as people get encouraged by seeing that they can do all these things that they didn't know they could do. And all of us have to learn that we are all way more powerful than we believe we are so that we can start 
tackling these problems that no one's been able to really face ever since it's been well publicized, as you were mentioning the other day, for over 50 years, it's been well known these problems are, uh, are on, uh, on the horizon, and now they're not on the horizon, we're there. So, um, yeah, we've got to start facing these things. And the only way to do that is by getting together with other people and encouraging each other and seeing what grows from it. But you already said maybe we don't have the time. Maybe um, we don't. Don't we need... Uh like hardcore activism, like gluing yourself to planes, for example? If people feel called to glue themselves to a plane, I'm not going to stop them. Um, if people feel like they need to uh, uh, go to uh, you know, lobby Congress or, or uh, Parliament, I'm not going to stop them for either. We should all do what we feel called to do, and it's the summation of everyone doing what they feel called to do that's going to enact the change that we need. Not one single thing. Yeah. So... Um, so yeah, um, but again, uh, we can do a lot by ourselves, but we can do so much more sharing our resources in community. And we did evolve to do that, but in our modern days, we suck at it. You know, and anyone who's been a part of any kind of community, whether it's a community of one person or two people, we can have strife. And if it's several people, it's even more challenging. Um, whatever tools we used to have, and we probably had them, are kind of gone. We've got to make this up as we go along now. Um, but it's very rewarding, even as it's very difficult and a lot of work. Yeah. Gerard, when you first entered the uh, hacker space, what was your impression of, of what was going on there? Well, it was an impression that you... Uh, it was not very strange, you know, you, you, you know the masks and uh, of... Uh, how is he called? Uh, Anonymous? Uh, yeah. Oh, Guy Fox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guy Fox, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and there were all the, these pirate kind of uh, things, you know, so at, at first it was, it was a bit like I expected, but it was totally different when I saw the people, what they were talking about, what they were doing, uh, and... Uh, so you, you've got this saying, uh, so if, if you're the smartest person in the room, go to another room. Uh, so if, if you're in a hackerspace, you never have to worry about that, you know. So it's, there are some terrible, terrible smart people who know some th things about, about radio waves or about, uh, well, the, the very specific hardware which is present in some machines. So they, they've got a very deep knowledge. So they're, 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 they can be very annoying to me <laughs> because say, I'm, I'm writing, you know, I'm making mistakes and they don't really don't like mistakes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so they, they don't like writers that, that make up stories and that kind of stuff. It, it's got to be specific. They, 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 m most of them like more like a spreadsheet with good information, if you know what I mean. But it's a ve very interesting crowd and I, I, I couldn't imagine wh what they... Uh, uh, were related to also, you know, the the, the, in, the information security world, uh, the, the the military, the uh, whatever. They're they're all very uh, one handshake away of very interesting things. I, I was a DJ with the uh, the other guy, the Easy Loas. We were a DJ <laughs> duo, uh, and, and and I had to think about these festivals because you were on stage and there were the people, and then it's sort of that's sort of normal life. Mm -hmm. And then you've you've got backstage and you've got these people that did all the, the audio technicians and that kind of people. They, were, they, they are very powerful. They know everything what's going on. They know about uh, the artists, how annoying they are or how uh, nice they are or whatever. So they know a lot of things. And I think that's the same with the hacker scene. They know an awful lot about the world. They see backstage. They, 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 they build maybe the, the, the rooms in the banks uh, that, that control uh, financial things. They, they make the things here behind the... Uh, the Etienne, the I think here, you know. So they, they know about the financial world, they know about media, they know about a lot of uh, things. And then uh, in their spare time, they're just like soldering these really weird shits with lights and things that... So that it, it's a very interesting community, I think. <laughs> Astrid, you were, were a member of the House of Commons or the representatives in the Netherlands for the Labour Party. Um, now you're uh, a hacker, or maybe back then already. Um, do you think you have more, had more influence then on society, or do you think you're contributing to society more now? I think I have more influence now, but it was good. I was in parliament for almost five years, 
uh, because I tried to hack it from the inside out, but that didn't work completely. But I also did some good stuff for some of the uh, laws especially the responsible disclosure. So I created my own work. I didn't know back then, but I know now. Well, work, volunteer work, before people think I'm one of those politicians who make their own work. So, And then you can pay yourself. That's not, uh, <laughs> that's not it. But I think uh, because I was there for five years, the first two years they thought I was completely crazy. They didn't understand me. I didn't understand them. They thought I was like some weirdo, always talking about privacy and tech and tech for good and data. And, um, and now they all asking me as an advisor mm -hmm. uh, to help on good, uh, uh, making good laws, uh, do we need? Do we really need uh, crypto? Yeah, uh, uh, crypto uh, graphics. Uh, uh, how about uh, big data? Data for good. Can you use it? They just ask me stuff, and they trust me now. Mm -hmm. And they didn't when I was a member of parliament because I was for a, a member for a party. Mm -hmm. And that's they don't look at you as a person. They look at you as okay, you're for. You're in that party, you're a part of the coalition, so you must be bad. And that's, that was the really hard part for me because all I wanted to do was to make the world better for our people. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing now with uh, DIVD and with uh, DIVD Academy. It's like a hackerspace, but we teach youngsters. Uh, well, we don't have to teach them how to hack, they know, but we teach them the ethical side because we want to have them on the yeah on the good side we have cookies <laughs> <laughs> real cookies <laughs> real cookies <laughs> so that's and that's what are also here in the story of uh, it's it's about community building to make sure you feel welcome you feel seen you you feel her, uh, hurt not yeah. hurt but yeah hurt, hurt <laughs> yes because a lot of our kids our youngsters are being pestered at school uh, and they are very uh, vulnerable to uh, bad people because bad people see them, and that's what's going on in the hackers community. Oh, some might say, wow, you're really good at this. Can you do also this? Can you hack this credit card? Can you help me? But also military people are doing that to young kids. So we want to, to get, get, the, yeah, uh, get the sheeps together, uh, sheep all them. And yeah. <laughs> take care of them and tell them how to be an ethical well for me all hackers are ethical but because if you're not you're a criminal mm. but we want to teach them how to be an ethical hacker just one more thing on community you say it's creating a positive cultural context how can we uh, just uh, f regarding the big crises that are facing us how can we speed it up and uh, get, get more communities and more positive cultural context. Yeah, well, I wish I had an answer for that too. It's more challenging now than ever. Um, the social context now is one of, um, you know, fascism is on the rise everywhere. And uh, neoliberal capitalism has uh, made it so that more and more people are speculating in real estate, housing in particular, but also places where people can meet in public. And, um, it's getting more expensive for energy and we're not necessarily making more money. So the amount of money we have is uh, buying power is less. Um, and yet we evolved to come together in communities. So somehow we have to do it. And, um, and we are, but um, yeah. Meanwhile, all these people are competing with each other at work. All these people are competing with each other um, in other ways. Everyone is atomized, as you said, at dinner. Um, you know, and, and we can do so much more when we pool our resources together than if we're all on our own. And if we're on our own, we're so, we're using so much of our energy just to uh, go through the day-to-day -day aspects of maintaining our lives. Um, and then on top of that, if you have to struggle to get enough money in order to pay for food and shelter, 
wow, how do we get a majority of people on the planet in, into um, a place where they have the opportunity to get together in some kind of functional community? And uh, I don't have that answer. I wish I did. Are you positive or pessimistic? <laughs> um, um, I, I think it's really dangerous to be pessimistic, and I think it's really dangerous to be optimistic. Why? Because that's <coughs> not real. If, if I'm being optimistic, then, you know, things will work out anyways. Why even bother for me to do anything? It's just going to work out. And if I'm being pessimistic, why bother? Because everything's shit anyways. So um, I think the only way that things are going to get uh, better for real is if we all, as many people as possible, see things the way they are. And then we can channel our energies uh, individually and collectively to do as best as we can with the energy we have. Great. Can I have a very warm applause for Mitch Helton? <laughs> <laughs> and Astrid Osenberg and Pierre Johnson.